we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed so let us connect to last week's message by reminding ourselves of the second accession by this lady we have been discussing. Yet was so a war, baby. I did a senedian, a year, and you perceive a coso a war. Thank you, Tangu, dear, na a bayano, any, so a pony penny no edino. A second accession. Again, Tirane tossum, you know. Now, so quote and non quote. If ever I choose to marry and the relationship goes bad, I shall not be trapped in it. We are hardly blind. We see what marriage has done to our parents and to others, and we do not like what we see. Wo abaya ne kase muno ense mo kanye nubi ene se se ayi mi se mi unwaria na se yankufa mi woma mi de kwa wari ni mumpo eto esani mo mi koswa entinem she me ni anase yeni enfry yuhunu ni awari ayi ya wofo eni ebinum ni ani yuhunu no yempe yuhunu no yempe. We do not like what we see. See, it is significant to note that many people are yearning for living examples of people who live in harmony and radiate marital happiness and optimism. Now look at this picture. If your marriage is not good, when you look at them, you envy them. There's something about man, woman, husband, wife that is beautiful. You see, if apart from Jesus, who is the savior of the world and the Holy Spirit Jesus gave to the church, if there's anything good for me that God has given mankind, then it is marriage. Hmm. You think about it. I'm saying to me, so if it's not to you, don't worry. In fact, what the world is asking for is not another lecture on marriage. No, not another lecture on marriage and family life. Yeah, not at all. But an authentic marriage and family life. I don't think this lady is against God. I don't believe she's against the institution of marriage either. But what she is seeing is affecting her perception about the institution called marriage and by extension family life. How do we as Christians Respond to her quests. Yeah, yeah, Jidifui and a Christophui, a bad day near to me and my pa, a diamond. How do we prove to her and the world that God is not a liar? A bad day near to me and my bribia, Jinaswakas, when you're uncoupon, you're no quaffo, and that marriage is good, and whoever finds a spouse finds favor with the Lord, as the scripture has said. Our brothers, who will stand bail for God? Who will stand bail for God? Who is his witness? Who will come to his defense? It is not enough to say, Lord, I love you. When people are castigating him here, left and right, and they are saying that he gave us something evil, who will be his defense? See, the primary role of the disciples 
were to be witnesses to the fulfillment of scripture in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Let me repeat that. And it is on the screen. And I want us to read together if you can. The primary role of the disciples were to be witnesses to the fulfillment of scripture in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If that was their primary agenda, ours should be the same. See, and the power of the Holy Spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost was to quicken them to do just that. How do I know it? We go back to our most powerful Pentecostal scripture. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, what's the difference? But you will receive power. The ability to do. The ability to have good marriage. The ability to live a sanctified life in the midst of an unsanctified world. The power to be a man among men. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you be my witnesses. That is why I'm saying that. The primary goal and role of the disciples was to be witnesses of Christ. But I want to talk a bit about the legacy of the resurrection. Still looking at we being witnesses. Because I want us to determine to stand in bail for God. Let us rise and come to his defense that God is not a liar. So remember that the promise of the Holy Spirit was given by Jesus before he ascended. And Dr. Luke dwelled more on it in his first book. Luke chapter 24. From 45 through 49. Luke 24, 45 through 49. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Remember that he says, this is what is written. And what is written is a law. It is the truth. I'll come back to this. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached. In his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then look at verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. Full stop. 48. 
This one is standing on his own. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. See, from this teaching, Jesus was trying to let the disciples know about the legacy, the resurrection, how to live on earth. Yes, that is beautiful. If we limit the proof of the resurrection to the empty grave, it will be problematic in our generation. Many of us will have money to go to Israel to even go and check whether actually the grave is empty. And if they show that this is the grave, how will you prove that this was where Jesus lived? Even then, the disciples saw the grave empty. Empty indeed. Yet, they still had some doubts. Even them. They more readily believed that the body had been stolen. How much less our generation? Their doubts were, however, cleared when Jesus continued to manifest himself to them for a proof that he is risen. I'm not saying that the grave was not empty. Yes, the grave was and is still empty. And yes, But we need something more than the empty grave to prove that Jesus is alive. And that his word is true. See, the real generational proof of the resurrection, I believe, is what the master himself said here in Luke chapter 24. And this one beats all arguments. Now we a bro. Let's go back to Luke 24. And let's start from 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Now this has to do with the two disciples on their way to Amos that he went to their home with them and the Bible says he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them this is what is written. So what is written is the truth. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. So, as of the time he was talking to them, this one had come to pass. And what that means is that thereafter, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. See, that is why in the name of Jesus, many things will happen. As Peter and Co. were preaching, in the name of Jesus, the Sanhedrin were confused. Because if the man were dead, why is his name raising the dead? Because 
Peter said, because death could not possibly keep him in the grave. Peter said, I believe that the lame man who had legs at the beautiful gate, he can explain these things to you better than I can. Yeah. The preaching in the name of Jesus. Mm. Number two. You are witnesses of these things. What this means is that the Christian is going to be the testimony of the resurrection. We have to prove that what God has said is correct. The third one is I'm going to send you what my father has promised. You see, so on the day of Pentecost, when people were Thinking that they were drunk, Peter said, Hey, don't think that we are drunk. This is what Jesus said. That when he ascends to the Father, he will send us the promise. So, so far as Peter and Co were concerned, the coming of the Holy Spirit is an evidence that Jesus has arrived in heaven. Any time that we speak about the Holy Spirit, what it means is that Jesus, when Jesus came to die, he was buried, he was raised from the dead on the third day, he ascended into heaven, and from heaven came the Holy Spirit. This is a proof of the resurrection. No arguments, no generation, no generation, unless the Holy Spirit dies, and he is a creator God, he would never die. But for the sake of our message, I will dwell on you are witnesses of these things. Maybe on a good Easter Sunday, I'll talk about other three. But let's dwell on you are witnesses. You are witnesses. So who is a witness? A person who sees an event. He sees an event. A witness is a person who has knowledge of an event from observation and experience. So someone who sees an event or someone who knows of an event. The third definition that I want us to dwell on is one who has evidence or proof of a matter. So, such like that you could give demonstration of it by action. You see, um, there were these two ladies who fought in the market. Now, they fought fiercely. So they were apprehended by the police. Three friends of one um, went to the husband's house uh, offering themselves to be witnesses. Hmm. They offered themselves to testify to or to afford evidence of the case. See, the lawyer of the lady decided to seek information from these three friends. 
As to what really happened. Before they presented themselves as formal witnesses. So the lawyer started interrogating. Her first question to the three of them was simple. Did you see them fight? And all of them are also sellers. They were neighbors. I mean, they have their shops around. So they all lifted their hands and they said, we all saw it. Hey, the way they were fighting. I mean, <laughs> Do you know the cause of this brow? One of them said, oh, when I got there, <laughs> <laughs> the fight was almost complete. <laughs> he had finished fighting. Then the lawyer said, you stand aside. So the second and the third witness, they gave the reason why they fought. It has to do with some money. But to them, they have been crying over this money over one year, and somehow they were not surprised it had to end the way it ended. So the first one has been effectively eliminated. So then the lawyer asked the two, Are you sure of what you are telling me? How do you prove that what you are saying is the truth? The third one said, this. Listen, this cut on my forehead. When they were fighting, I tried to separate them. And then I had this cut. Then the second one said, See, yes, I know that if I saw them, I know, I saw them, I know, I saw them. This one said, I saw them, I know, but this is my proof. Which of these three qualifies to be a true witness? Anyway, you'll be thinking about it. You see, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 5 says this. 1 John 1, from 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This is what we proclaim concerning the word of life. That which was from the beginning, we write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Now, how is he confident? Why is he saying that God is light? And in him, there is no darkness at all. You see, because John is saying this. That which we heard from the beginning, they heard. Which we have seen with our eyes. So we didn't just hear. We saw with our, our naked eyes. And we didn't just see. We looked at it. So they saw. 
But they got closer and looked at it. And that was not enough. And our hands have touched. We have had experience of him. So we are telling you that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. That is what he is trying to say. He has a proof of who the light is. Who God Jesus is. Who he is. You see brothers, it is not enough to see Jesus like the Samaritan woman did. It is not enough to know and teach about Jesus like Apollos would do. The word must be made flesh. Men should be able to see it. They should be able to look at it. And they should be able to touch it. They should be able to experience it. It is not enough to say marriages are good. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. Let the world see. Let them look at it. Let them experience it. By your marital life. Because you are a witness. You have to stand in bail for God. You are a witness. So prove it. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it, please. Prove it, please. There must be evidence of what we profess. There must be evidence of what we profess. As witnesses. We need to give demonstration of our belief. We need to give a demonstration of our belief by action. That makes a true witness. See, the true witness goes to court to give or afford evidence of a matter in defense of someone. So in the same way, we need to, by our marital life and our family life, afford evidence in defense of God and his way. Are we together? Do you understand what God is telling us? Whether marriage becomes a blessing or a torment depends on the two people involved and not because God has given us something evil. No. Can we read together? Whether marriage becomes a blessing or torment depends on the couple involved and not because God has given us something evil. No. We then, as Christians, should protect the institution of marriage. Our marriages should prove God right. That marriage is good. And that anyone who finds a spouse finds favor with the Lord. We need to do this for the sake of people like the lady in question. And then salvage this generation for our God. See, brothers, we are the light of the world. If the light goes off, it puts the whole world in jeopardy. Many people, brothers and sisters, are yearning for living examples of people who live in harmony and radiate marital happiness and optimism. Now, take this big one. When we lead responsible and exemplary marital lives, 
we have opportunity to at least do two things. We have opportunity to influence both our neighbors' marriages and the future marriages of our children. It has generally been observed that a well-disciplined and godly family speaks more about the church and Christ than all the sermons that can be preached. It is because of this that the primary role of the disciple is to be a witness. When I went to Agunan Saba, the old ladies actually taught me Christianity. <laughs> They me you see, I knew scripture and I knew so many things, but these ladies, they didn't even bother about all the Greek terms that I was talking about. Those days, I used to talk about Greek terms and all that, and I would ask them to be repeating. I said, my friend, <laughs> and then, but, but, but their life, they taught me Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw one pastor who was also doing like I used to do. As I said, your church. <laughs> I mean, just these things, have them at the background. Let them help you at home. But when you come to church, Kachi, Kambrofo, unless. You are a teacher of that language and you are in school, but don't disturb them with that. Proof by your lifestyle. That you are good Christian. Now, as I end, we'll continue next week. But as I bring today's message to a close, I want to ask you this question. Is God a liar? Is marriage something good? You are a witness. Is God a liar? Do you think that the institution of marriage is good? And let us bail him out. Let us stand bail for him. Let us rise by our actions in defense of the mighty one.